you have to talk a little bit about Man United versus Arsenal. As you guys know, Man United lost 1-0 at home to Arsenal. Um, overall, the performance wasn't that bad considering how poorly we played against Crystal Palace. I thought we were way more compact. We defended way more as a team. We attacked kind of like a team, a little bit disjointed, but still we played way better. And the big, the big improvement I felt like was definitely this middle section. This middle section of the two centre-backs in Casemiro, Johnny Evans, and Kobe Maino and Amrabat were a far more better unit, even with some Tomini. Not really. No, it's got Tomini. Fuck him. But these four players, I felt like, were a far more better and solid defensive block. Obviously, Casemiro was at fault for the goal. He didn't run back on side quick enough, which then led to the ball being able to go out onto the wings, which was then cut into the inside, which then led to Trossard running in front of his man and kind of finishing at the near post. Cool. Very avoidable, but still... Still, I feel like considering how open, how poor we looked against Crystal Palace, to have this lineup and to have Amrabat play alongside Maino or to be the most deep lining midfielder and have Maino basically playing up behind McTominay was a far better lineup. The only problem for me is that it showed that Eric Ten Hag can be somewhat. It showed that Eric Ten Hag can use the players that he has to his to his that he has available in order to kind of get a particular result or performance because he's always saying in the media that the reason why we're playing so poorly, the reason why we're eighth and maybe going, going to be lower is because we have mad injuries, which I don't think is true. I think by the eye, if you watch United by the eye, you don't go just by stats, and you don't believe the propaganda and the flipping gaslighting of the manager, you can see that even when, you know, um, what you call it, Lissandra Martinez was back in the squad, even when we did have a solid defensive partnerships um, or we didn't move or didn't change our defense too much, we still didn't play that great of football really in general we didn't really play that well so this idea that you know Lissandro Martinez is the one player that's set in pace and without him and Luke Shaw we can't play football is really dumb because there's been plenty of games where we've played Lissandro Martinez and Luke Shaw two left-sided defenders playing in that position and we still have played poorly the problem is our style of play overall doesn't bring the best out of the players we have um I don't think Eric Ten Hag has figured out where, how he wants his team to play. Are we quick transitioning? Are we possession based? Do we have a low block? Do we have a mid block? Whatever. He has no idea, and it's all over the gap, which is part of the reason why I want him to be gone. But this particular game showed that he can make the best of what he has, even with the injuries. Because, you know, Amrabat hasn't really played that much this season. Uh, Maino's been basically exhausted. Casemiro's in the midfield, I can't play centre-back. But he was able to get the partnership right and jig it around. If it was up to me, and I was being the guy, and I was a, a manager, if you, were, if you were willing to, you know, name Kamwala, who just come back from injury, a young player, centre-back, I would have played him as centre-back. I would have much preferred to play him or another young um, academy player who was on the bench who can play defence in defence and then play the senior players in their favourite positions. I don't understand this preference of like putting, you know, midfielders in positions that they shouldn't be playing just because they're senior players. I hate that shit. I think um, Eric Ten Hag did the same thing with Amrabat when he first joined. Um, at the time when Amrabat joined on loan from Fiorentina, Luke Shaw and Malasia were still out. So for some reason, um, Eric Ten Hag played Amrabat as a left back. And obviously, it didn't help him because he's a defensive midfielder. He's obviously not as good as maybe he showed in the World Cup, but he's still a good player. But we're playing him at left back. So, of course, he's not going to play well. So, that obviously went to shit. Um, so, I would much prefer to see the, our senior players play in their favorite positions and then get the young players to fill in the gaps. That didn't happen. It is what it is. Overall, I felt like for all the hype of how people were talking about United and how we played, I also feel like Arsenal played within themselves. Some people would say they were scared, they were timid, but they were going for the league title. They needed to ensure that they got three points on the board. That was the main priority. It didn't matter how they played. They just wanted to get out of Old Trafford with three points secured. And they did their job. And I think, personally, they did their job not coming out of second gear. They were very comfortable. Um, we didn't really, you know, threaten them too much. And when we did, they dropped back a bit. They let us have the ball when we had it. And then as soon as we got maybe into their area or into the box they kind of attacked us and kind of let us go out which is different to what they usually do because usually they're a high pressing side that tries to get the ball off of you from when you have it in defense but this time around they let us kind of have it and then kind of load us into force into security and then obviously try to hit us on the counter cool so i think if in general if arsenal would have went for it they probably could have won by more but they also could have risked losing easily because we're one of those jammy teams that even when we're not playing well we can produce individual moments of brilliance i think a special mention has to be held out for garnacho i know he gets a lot of hate and against his decision making isn't the greatest he can be very greedy but his 
insistence and his ability to keep on attacking his defender, to keep on going, to keep on running down the line is really admirable. And to be honest, was the difference maker in terms of us being a threat. And if anything, he was the one player who I felt like was really going to make something happen apart from Ahmad Diallo, who I'll come on to. And the whole entire game, I feel like he had Ben White on skates. And Ben White has been one of the best fullbacks or best defenders flat out this season. And I thought that Garnacho really had the fucking test, had the beating of Ben White. He was going at him again and again and again and again. And most often than not, he was able to dribble past him. But unfortunately, the final ball, the final shot never really came off for him. But still, big up um, fucking Garnacho. I also want to give a big shout out to Ahmad Diallo. He hasn't started a game in forever for United. Um, he's one of our forgotten men. I don't really know why. Um, considering how poorly Anthony's been playing, Ahmad Diallo should be playing way more often for United. He's way more comfortable on the ball, you know, uh, keeps possession really well, recycles the ball really well, great close control. And if anything, he's very deceptively fast. He has a very good acceleration, especially with the ball at his feet across five to 10 yards. Uh, he can really impact things. I would prefer it, you know, if, if it was up to me, ideally, I'd like to see Diallo further forward so he gets the balls in the danger areas of the of the field and he's not so far back so he doesn't have to cover such long distances. But I think as a team, if you watch United, you'll see that our players have to run further. Like, even at this game, if you watched it, you'd see, you know, Odegaard kind of get the ball and be comfortable and pass it and the ball would kind of travel very quickly up the field without Arsenal players having to run. Whereas United players always have to fucking run a 5K to get the ball from one end to the other end because there's such big gaps in between our lines. Whatever. Let, l least of that, the better. Um, and also I have a big shout out to Amrabat. Amrabat's had a really hard time at United, Amrabat. Um, I feel like we are kind of in a weird place with May United when it comes to midfielders. We sign midfielders such as Amrabat, um, such as like Soberslai, well, not Soberslai, um, I forgot his flipping name. The guy that came from Dortmund with the long hair. Um, I forgot his name at the moment. But we sign midfielders and for some reason, we like to just let them go and keep the ones we have. So in the time that McTominay has been around, we've signed probably three or four defensive midfielders who we haven't really kept and we just moved on from. But I would prefer to have Amrabat as a squad option than to have McTominay as a squad option. Personally for me, he's way more versatile. He's way better in that position. He can defend better as well. And you just have, you can expect a certain level of performance from him. You can always expect like a 6 out of 10 from Amrabat, especially if he gets given games to play in his position. Whereas a McTominay is useless. This particular game is being a good example of it. McTominay got to play in his, I think, in his best position, which is in that number 8, number 10 position. Because McTominay is unfortunate in that he was born really tall and really big. So he's like six foot three, six foot four. He's obviously a really fit dude and really muscular and whatever. So people mistaken his build for a defensive midfielder. But he's not. He can't defend. He doesn't really have good spatial awareness. He can't read the game that well. But what he's really good at is those late runs into the box. Almost Frank Lampard-esque. So he's got a good goal scoring record for United and for Scotland for running into the box late. But apart from that, he's fucking garbage. When the ball gets at his feet, he doesn't know what to do. He can't pass. He can't control. Doesn't really have good dribbling ability. Even though he's a powerful runner, he's pretty shit. And shouldn't be playing at United. He's a player that is probably not even fucking Sheffield United worthy level. I'm curious actually to see what level of club Scott McTominay ends up at when he eventually leaves United. Because I think that's going to be a real big wake-up call to our fans to realise just how shit these guys are. When Luke Shaw leaves, when Harry Maguire leaves, when Scott McTominay leaves, when fucking Bruno Fernandes leaves, when Rakhul Rashford leaves, when all these fucking cunts leave, we will realise pretty soon how terrible these guys actually were. So McTominay was garbage and he did this thing that I always hate with players. He did this thing that I hate with McTominay. Where if you've played football, you know what I mean. Where he kind of hides... But he doesn't. So what do I mean? He will stand in a position where he looks like he wants the ball. But he doesn't really want it. Because he's almost like in between four different players. So he's kind of in space. But not really in space. And he was doing that quite often. Especially after the first 15 minutes. When I think his confidence kind of dipped. He was almost standing in these like no area. No, you know, these like no pass zones. Where like you're surrounded by four opposing players. Of course no one's going to pass it to you. Because you're going to get tackled straight away. So I hate when he does that shit. Hoyland, unfortunately as well, not his best game. I'm a big fan of Rasmus Hoyland, but I think, yes, he's not getting the ball past him what, um, enough. There's a report that came out recently that says um, Rasmus Hoyland's teammates don't trust him. That's why they don't pass the ball to him. They don't think he's that good, which I think is preposterous. The fact that these players can, you know... Um, fucking determine who is worthy of a pass or not is ridiculous and it goes to show how um indulged 
how fucking ridiculous, how entitled, how much of an ego these worthless, no accomplishing shit average players have on our team. And the quicker we get them out, the better. But obviously, as we have to thank the Glazers for that. But I understand where they're coming from to some extent because when Ramon Tolan does get the ball, he doesn't keep it well enough. Top strikers in the game nowadays, if you can't link play, you have to be a good point man. So if you can't drop into a 10, if you can't drop into an 8 position and pick up the ball and then spread it out wide, similar to what Harry Kane does and shit, then you have to be a good just battering round up front where things get to you and they stick. Unfortunately with Hoyland, when the ball gets to him at the front, it doesn't stick. Whether it's at like his chest, whether it's head height, whether it's on his feet, it always bounces off. And if anything, watching this particular game, he reminded me of Lukaku. I was watching this game, I was like, shit, Rasmus Hoyland is almost like a white Lukaku in that if he's closest to the goal, it's cool because his instincts will kick in and you just lever the ball into the top corner. But if he's further away and he has to do something, he's completely shit. And he just doesn't know what to do. He shits the bed. He, you know, he, he's got a touch of somebody wearing Timberlands when they're playing football. It's quite awful. So Rasmus Hoyland has a lot of improving to do. But again, I don't blame him also. He's a very young player. And he's been having to be replied upon because our senior players, namely Anthony Martial, has been out the entire season injured. He's obviously leaving at the end of the season. But those senior players who should be giving Hoyland a rest and allowing him to develop underneath him were not reliable and can't be counted on. So he's having to be the person playing all the time. And unfortunately now, especially I saw Cam say the other day, actually, we're using Hoyland like he's fucking James Beatty. He's running up and down the field, left and right. He's not, he's exhausting himself. He's not receiving the ball in space where he should get it. It's fucking awful. So overall, um, decent performance. Obviously the result, not what we wanted. The, the, the season is already over anyway, so I don't really give a fuck. But I feel like the gods were looking over us and blessed us because... At the end of the game, the fucking heavens opened up. And I think that was a good thing because after this particular performance, because it was only 1-0 and a lot of us fans, especially United fans, are very, you know, you know, cynical people. We all thought we were going to get battered 5-0. So because it was 1-0, some giddy fans, especially some of those Eric Ten Hag sexuals out there, you fucking cunts, they were getting happy that we only lost 1-0. And they were kind of using it as a, oh, see, if you give him time, if you give him time, uh, we can do something. Okay, cool. The heavens opened up and it reminded us just how far away we are from competing at a top level because this showed where we are as a club level-wise. This fucking wet, this, obviously the heavens opened, it started raining in Manchester and obviously Old Trafford is in a state of disrepair. It needs, it, it needs to basically be knocked down and started again. But because the Glazers have been one of the worst owners ever in football, they haven't invested in the restructuring or the rebuilding of, or, or the repairs of the stadium or even building a new stadium. So the, at the end of that Arsenal game, when everyone was giddy about the result, we were reminded of just how far away we are from the top teams. Because look at this shit. Look at the inside of the change rooms in Man United and look at all the water leaking. <laughs> That allegedly is a change room of one of the biggest clubs in the world. The change room of a club that has the highest net spend of all the teams in fucking world football. This is the one. Big old Man United has a fucking change room where it's leaking all over the roof. So this is an example that, hey, we have a long way to go. And the Glazers are have all the blame. They have all the blame to fucking take and accept for where we are as a club. And look at this at the end. This is at the end on Sky Sports News. It features um, Ayrton Hogg clapping the fans. And look at how wet it is. Obviously, on, in the stadium, you can see the rain. But look at the way the rain that's coming into the stadium itself. Absolutely crazy. Miserable day for Manchester United in the rain around old. Trafford. Look at that. Cracks appearing Everywhere. in the stadium. Cracks, it seems, have been there in the dressing room for. That was prophetic. That exposed everything the Glazers have been trying to hide with plasters, with plasters being shiny new signings, big celebrity managers and shit. Nah. The basis of our club is fucked because these fucking greedy, um, horrible owners who've destroyed our club through 19 years of mismanagement and crappy ownership have now, all the chickens have come home to roost because this is where we're at. We have a club, we have a stadium that looks like a stadium you'd see at Sunday league level where there's no fucking shelter and you're just being opened up by the fucking heavens. No fucking shelter, no roof, right? R water leaking everywhere all over the place, flooding all over the place. Absolutely diabolical. For most of this campaign let's hear from eric ten Hag after a so you see that there's another video too that shows one more rain look at that water <laughs> Cr 
crazy. And another one finally of people walking out, how wet it was outside. And then one final one. But there you go, there is the Old Trafford waterfall. Yeah, see that, look at that title. Man United have spent 1.19 billion on transfers in the past 10 years, but can't afford to avoid leaks. Famous now across the world. Uh, they haven't fixed it yet. And to Jim Ratcliffe, who is here today, can add that to the growing list. Disgraceful, utterly disgraceful. But again, I'm happy the season is somewhat over now. Um, we can kind of concentrate on the summer and hopefully getting a lot of these shit cunt players out of our team, hopefully changing managers and really seeing a change. Because I think the big example or the big hint for change at United won't be who we sign in. It will be who we sell, the outgoings. The outgoings will tell me a lot about what this current Ineos sporting ownership is going to do. Personally, I don't have any faith. I don't think you can have two masters. I don't think you can have the Glazers having the majority ownership of the club and then having a partial ownership to Enios who control the sporting side of things. I just don't think it works. There's no like flat hierarchy thing. There has to be a boss and, a, you know, the all right boss all right over the top. And I don't think you can have two at the same time. But if it is going well and if it is the right thing, we will see it vis-a-vis -vis the fucking outgoings because we have to get rid of a lot of players in this squad. A lot of players in this squad don't deserve to play for this club, don't deserve to earn the salary that they're earning and are really stealing a living and they need to be gone ASAP and they're obviously toxic personalities and shit and are holding us back as a team. If anything as well, as a last point to make, as a last point to make, wasn't it interesting to see how much better as a team we played in midfield holding the ball without Bruno Fernandes? Yes, we suffered because we didn't have the attacking threat um, there was no real balls over the top, no good shots on target, no late runs, cool. But without Bruno Fernandes as a midfielder, we keep the ball far better with Diallo, with Garnacho, with Amrabat, with Gmeno, maybe not McTominay, but those four players kept the ball far well, far much, well, far better than what Bruno Fernandes does when he plays. Because Bruno Fernandes does that thing that I always hate, where he always looks for that Hollywood pass around the corner. He's always looking for that quick ball around the corner, over the top, never really keeping possession, never really trying to dictate play, never really trying to go the, the, the opposition out of position, always just trying to hit the ball first time, which I fucking hate. No control, no nothing, just fucking vibes over the top. But with Mayno, Amrabat, Diallo and Garnacho playing together, that was amazing to see. So that was the only good positive. Apart from that, shit season, can't wait till it's over. And I hope the whole entire team gets sold in the summer, if I was being honest.